emerging markets. And when I woke up this morning, I realized it's a 45-minute discussion and we are looking to address and impact one of the most critical conversations of our time. Not impossible. Anyway, we're going to keep it very, very simple, and we are going to really focus on the finance that we need to address the situation when it comes to climate finance across emerging markets and developing markets in order to ensure that the whole world can meet their objectives by Agenda 2030 and then, of course, net zero by 2050. Again, We've got 45 minutes. We're having opening discussions. Before I introduce my esteemed panelists, thank goodness they're here to help me solve this 45-minute uh, equation for the world. But before we do that, it is my honor to introduce to you Mahmoud Mohaldin. He's the UN Special Envoy, Envoy on Financing the 2030 Agenda and COP27 High-Level Climate Action Champion, Dr. Mohidin, would you like to just set some context for us as we go into this high-powered discussion for the next 45 minutes? I've got, given you four minutes, sir. Right, very generous. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, good morning uh, to you all. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are around the world. I came here with good intentions not to be controversial. Uh, this is the intention, but let's see how it will end. Um, <laughs> Climate finance is and should be development finance. And we have been victims, not just in emerging markets and developing economies, of a reductionist approach to sustainability, for it to mean only climate and climate change, and for climate change to mean only mitigation, and for mitigation to mean carbon and carbon pricing. I'm not undermining the importance of any of that, but I shouldn't really be ignoring the connection between the efforts that we should be doing in carbon, carbon pricing and energy and just energy transition to the development agenda. Without a holistic approach, we are missing a lot. We are a without a holistic approach, we cannot convince the poor who are getting poorer after crisis upon crisis, COVID, Ukraine now with food security challenges, financial challenges, um, access to all kinds of fuel and indeed matters related to food security because of shortage of fertilizers. So in order to convince the general public and the policy makers, even if you are specialized in energy or you are specialized in carbon, you need to have this holistic approach. And it's not difficult because at the end of the day, climate change is SDG 13 of the sustainable development goals that had been blessed by more than 190 countries back in 2015. Just operationalize that and we'll be in business. Second, Nigel and I, the, um, the champion for Glasgow and beyond, um, we have been talking about pledges, claims, people much more articulate than me taking the floor and the stage, saying how much they love the planet, how much they claim that they need to do good uh, for it, but very little if implementation had happened since. I'm saying before Paris, during Paris, after Paris. So we don't need more pledges or claims. We need implementation in the field. Show us the money, show us the knowledge, and we can, in developing economies and emerging markets, we can provide pipeline of projects and the business environment that can support the projects. And we're not discovering new things. People talk about developing economies and emerging markets as if they haven't been hosting many successful high return operations around the developing economies and emerging world. Third point, regionalization. Some of the projects are going to be with a scale that will not really be feasible with some small economies. So regional approaches, not just for the good spirit of partnership SDG 17, but it makes sense when you are establishing such huge projects. So here, five, uh, five round tables, five fora are going to be established in partnership with UN system, with the regional economic commissions, with GFANs, those who have the 130 trillion plus, and those who have the project pipeline that could really be subject to good matchmaking. Localization. This is new in the business of COPs. For the first time ever, and of course I'm having Ms. Spinoza with us, this is the first time, this will make you happy, I hope, happier. That bottom-up approach, we're going to be running a competition in Egypt, starting with villages, townships, and cities, and districts, to select the best fitting 
companies who is, can establish themselves as green and smart at the same time. That will be bringing great deal of awareness to everyone. It's not going to be just for the elite and the experts who will be in Sharm Sheikh, but for everybody. Final point, finance. We have an issue with finance. 100 billion, good luck with that. We need that to be multiplied by a factor of five or 10, but that will not be sufficient. Private sector leverage by this kind of finance is going to be the solution. Meanwhile, it is, I would say, criminal to ask countries to buy um, their energy with high commercial debts and returns. So I said I was going to be strict with time. So the solutions, the solutions is going to be either grants or concessional loans or investment that will bring know-how and knowledge with them. Opportunities are there, part partnerships could be established, and there are many good models in the field that we can build on them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sir Rice. And now let me introduce to you my esteemed panel. I've got Patricia Espinoza. She is the Executive Secretary of the UN Framework Convention for Climate Change. We have Paddy Padmanathan, who's Vice Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Aqua Power. We have Minister Mamaloko Kubai, who is Minister of Human Settlements, South Africa, and Arifin Tasrif, who's Minister of Energy and Mineral Resources in Indonesia. Thank you very much. Now, we've got a very um, big agenda to fulfill. And Patricia, let's start with you. I mean, this has been your, your life for many, many years. I go back to May 2016. You took on this position as Executive Secretary. How are you feeling as we are eight years away from 2030 and we have deficits all over, those, all over the place, especially in the financing arena? Well, definitely we are still lagging behind. Uh, climate change is outpacing us in, in, in a way that we, we didn't even imagine just uh, a few years ago. And finance is no doubt one of the key issues that we can and should be put on the table in order to make the difference. I, um, I, I say uh, very frequently that this generation the generation of decision makers now have the rare opportunity to change the course of the history of humanity. And this is a very, very important moment because it's changing the history towards a resilient a well, a, a world where everybody can uh, thrive and have opportunities or a world where we will see much more destruction, uh, loss of lives, loss of livelihoods, more poverty. Uh, Mahmoud was um, uh, uh, talking about the SDGs and uh, yes, climate change is one of the SDGs, but at the same time, climate change is related to, uh, to almost all of the SDGs. So there's no doubt that climate change is at the center of uh, development. And so it has to be included when we try to define policies on transportation, on um, uh, agriculture production, on in general land Patricia, use. you made a comment. I've been watching many, many of your engagements in public forums, and you made a comment that there is a lot happening. So when we sit here and we have these discussions and we think it is just talk, 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 actually, no, there's a lot happening behind the scenes. Perhaps just a quick statement on that before I bring yes. to Patty. Yes, there is a lot happening. And I think there are very just amazing examples of uh, human ingenuity and capacity to, to, uh, to improve the situation. And even, uh, I would say, there are some solutions that don't even require a lot of uh, resources. But the truth is that we need to scale up and accelerate the deployment of those technologies especially in energy, in the transition towards uh, new and renewable energy. 
but in other in all of the fields. So the key, obviously, is the climate transition in emerging markets. Now, I would say that we can't have that conversation in isolation. In fact, we should have all of the presidents of the developed world in this room in terms of closing the financing gap. Paddy, I come to you. We're looking at $150 billion going into emerging markets on an annual basis right now. Ladies and gentlemen, we need one trillion US dollars on an annual basis to close the financing gap. Paddy, to you. Thank you. So that one trillion is there. It can be accessed. And let me start off by what you pointed out. A lot is happening. The challenge is it's happening very fast and we're not able to, even we who are involved with it, are not really understanding and grasping the value of it. So just a quick sort of uh, summary of it. Just in the last, about seven years ago, those of us, in fact, and in, in many cases even now, but those of us in the developing world, uh, emerging markets, whatever you want to call it, who have access to electricity, are, th that electricity is really costing anything from 200 to $300 a megawatt hour. Just keep that number in mind. Just today, we are starting to deliver. So it's happening over the last few years at $30. Look at the difference when the sun is shining and when the wind is blowing. Now, please don't get tangled up. That's intermittent. We consume a lot of energy and we can do a lot when the sun is shining and when the wind is blowing. So when energy is at that very high price, there isn't a hell of a lot you can do other than just use it for survival. But when energy is so low, you can create enormous multiplier effect, exactly like in the case of mobile phones. That's why people are running around the world carrying mobile phones, not because they're talking to friends, because they're creating value out of them. It is such a low cost. Energy has reached that level. We just need to understand that and stop talking about a risk premium. So the, dealing with the financing, so today, of that $150 billion, most of it, 80% of it is coming from IFIs, multilaterals, the, the equity part, the 20% is coming pretty much from the private sector at a premium. We know, we accept that the cost of money going into a developing world is six times the cost of money that is used in the developed world. But it is the IFIs who are charging that six times because it is them who are providing bulk of the debt. So step one, the IFI, the multilaterals, need to bring that cost down and accept that they're in the development business. So, Paddy, I'm going to pick up there because I think it's not just the risk premium of emerging markets. It is a risk premium that the world is facing. It doesn't matter if Europe goes into their own deals, new energy deals. If they do not address emerging markets, nothing is going to have traction in terms of climate change. That is the re reality. Minister Gubai, let's bring you in here. You've seen firsthand right now, KwaZulu-Natal is a province in South Africa at the moment being devastated by floods. In fact, just this weekend, we've had the next round. Climate change is with us and it is impacting everybody across the board. Minister Kubai, time is over now for frameworks. We've got all the frameworks. Fantastic. From the likes of Patricia and Dr. Mohaldin, et cetera. How do we change the game and get the developed world to believe that this is our joint problem? No, definitely. I think um, the first issue is both. Uh, I think the panelists as well spoke about the need to understand that as we do just transition, it has to be inclusive. It has to bring everybody on board. If we are to talk about the financing, be clear up front. I mean, the financing for COP26, very excited about it, but now we're doing a lot of work instead of starting to implement, understanding the conditions that follows, which derails the whole implementation of it. I think that's what Perry said. If it's up front clear to say, this is what we are getting, this is the condition of it, then there's not much work that needs to be done that we can move into the implementation. All emerging markets, many of the countries have done quantification. I mean, those who are here interested, I've got my DBSA, which is Development Bank of South Africa, who are here, released a book, quantified how much we need. So we're clear on what we need to do and how much we need. Therefore, it's very easy. It's not an issue that's, that's what you're saying. It's not an issue that we're still wanting to understand. Yeah. We know what needs to be done and we've got to do it. We know how much we need and where we need to put the resources. 
and therefore the talk shop has to end and we have to get into action but it has to be collaborative efforts both public private and civil society has to come on board so that all of us can ensure that we do not see the devastating that we are seeing i mean we get to bear the brand as emerging markets as you say we have a beautiful city that is currently being ravaged by the floods and many people being displaced um we bear in the brand of climate change as south africa so public private partnership but also and i'm going to drum this over and over again partnership between the developed and the emerging world we are in this together minister tasrif from indonesia's perspective you have set very stringent objectives in meeting agenda 2030 perhaps you can give us an indication of the traction that you're having there sir well uh, we we have uh, quite a tight uh, schedule yeah in order to reduce our emission in the country our target is to reduce uh, 400 million ton by 2030 we do uh, prepare such kind of plan of action how we are going to do that so it needs such kind of big support again like you like it was mentioned before we need support of technology we need also support of uh, competitive finance yeah. we prepare our roadmap up to 2060 where our target is to reduce the emission by 1.5 gigatons of uh, equivalent and again to reach that the money that will be re required to support us is more than one trillion US dollar. We have a huge source of renewable clean energy in the in the country. We need to build such kind of infrastructure in order to utilize them, to send from the source to the market. We want to make our industry green. Yeah, we want to make a big participation on emission reduction in the world. So we would like to collaborate with all parties which have which having the technology which having the access of finance yet uh, to, to to work together with us to achieve the goal by 2060 or even faster than that minister tasri you have the g20 presidential delegation arriving in indonesia in october and then of course they go to india in 2023 come october what are you asking the g20 well uh in this in, in our g20 member itself we we have to finalize yeah, the target of every countries when they are going to reach the year of net zero emission and that uh, all among the g20 countries we have to be clear about the programs about the technology yeah, about the finance so we can share priorities etc you know the, the 20 they share for 80, 80 more than 80 percent of the emission in the world in the, when we talk about indonesia emission per capita is low but we are producing fossils yeah we are willing to reduce it we do we plan we do in-house activity to reduce that yeah, as for the time being for instance that uh, we, re we, we, we we reduce the risk of uh, forest firing yeah we successfully reduced uh, 80 percent so that's why last year we reached uh, we reached the number of 80 million ton of co2 that we we can we can contribute to be to be reduced and great minister tasrif to see that the money being raised is being put to effect and certainly impacting climate transition patricia i want to come back to you we raised as the world 15 trillion us dollars for COVID 19 yeah. in emergency relief yes just 15 trillion dollars mm -hmm. click of a finger we're saying now and let me give this number to you another way that we need to increase climate finance 600 percent it's 590 percent on an annual basis to reach agenda 2030 we're not even talking about 2050 let's just get to 2030 so again i come back to climate finance and if you were able to make one decision right now would it perhaps be to punish those that don't behave and to reward those that do? Because I, I can only see that as the solution here. Well, you know, the multilateral system is about cooperation. It's about really uh, getting... No punishment. No punishment. Ah. It's about getting on the boat for the 
well-being of all and understanding that the well-being of, of one part of the puzzle is really the well-being of all of them. So I think uh, what we really need uh, to, to have as, as the ground uh, value is uh, cooperation and solidarity. And uh, in in our own individual interest. And I think that is what needs to be uh, understood before uh, that we go away from the idea that um, supporting this uh, transition, if we talk about energy, for example, supporting the transition means helping others. No, supporting the transition means we are investing in our own well-being. We are investing in a better future for all. Now, having said that, yes, definitely, finance is the, 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 I would say, the critical factor. It's not the only factor, it's true. And by the way, let me just uh, mention, in many developing countries, capacity building is also one of the very critical issues. But finance is certainly um, a, a, a critical uh, and point. And the finance is needed for that capacity building. Uh, correct. And, and you, you are mentioning, yes, uh, because of COVID, all this money was raised that went mainly to the, to the uh, bigger and the, the, more, the richer countries. Uh, imagine uh, what that meant for countries in, in our process uh, where they saw that the pledge made already in 2009 in Copenhagen of raising, mobilizing 100 uh, billion uh, yearly was not coming together. And at the same time, there was just this uh, enormous mobilization of resources that were not foreseen, that were not planned. Um, so this is really a, a very critical issue. It is also a trust issue. It's an element that is necessary to build the the necessary atmosphere to have developed and developing countries working together, having trust, seeing each other as equals and really working together, joining forces for a better world. And I, I see, Patricia, collaboration is very much a part of, of your ethos in the United Nations. What about carrot and stick? Is it not time, Patty? Come on. I mean, I've been, this is my 10th year in Davos, having these discussions for a decade now, and we're still at the same point. It's a different world today. That's the reason, right? I, I'm much, much more optimistic because, as I said to you, at $35, we have really now brought the risk levels down. So I think, to be very fair, uh, we need the private sector and the multilaterals to understand that, uh, that there is, the risk is very, very low now, uh, default risk and so on. So you shouldn't be charging so much for the money. We should be pushing the I, I'm private sector. We should be pushing the private sector to put more money at risk than just that 20% equity so that it can get blended with that lower cost of financing from the, uh, from the multilaterals. But also, let's not forget, the governments also need to, we can't just waltz into a country and uh, start implementing projects. We need, what is the, these are big capital inv intensive investments that we've recovered over a very long period of time. So what is it that we need? We need TLC, huh? not tender love and care, but transparency, longevity, and certainty of policy. Okay, we need clear policy signal and the government's giving that signal and maintaining that signal. And we need to make sure that the policymakers are aligned with regulators. So that, but that's know. a bit of a catch-22, because again, this is another topic when you talk about an enabling environment that we ask of the governments. It, we need a track record. Paddy, we need well, a track record. We haven't got time for them to build track records we don't need right the now. We don't need. At $35, I don't need the track record for Wagga Wagga Land to give me that. All I need is them to invite me, to allow me to come, open the door and say, you know, I'm not going to tie you with red tape. I'm not going to do this to you. Please. But, but where's the guarantee, Minister Kubai? Where's the guarantee that you're not going to change the rules? You take this big capital injection as an emerging market play, and it doesn't go to the right avenue. We know this all too well across the African continent. Look, I think one of the things that we have done is South Africa. Fred is, is one of our investors in yes. one of our provinces in the Northern Cape where we have a big yes. mega, one of the mega plants in terms of renewable. But I think the other issue where he talks about transparency, longevity and certainty, what we have done for the energy project, for example, for our environmental um, assessment, impact assessment, yeah. we've developed what we call the rates. So in terms of if you build within the zones that we have created, then we're reducing the time it takes for you yeah. to be able to apply for environmental impact assessment. So it reduces the red tape. We've paid attention more 
into those and we're starting to give certainty in the implementation of the projects. We're now paying attention into the regulator in terms of our NASA way we're talking about application for NASA. We've reduced that. We've what do we reduce it to just for clarity? On the application for environment, we used to have about 180 days. We've reduced that with more than 50%. Yeah, it's 90 days. I think that so there's, 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 there's a clap, don't you think? We're taking the red tape out of the situation. Thank so you. we're paying attention to the red tape. We're paying attention to like just making it easier in terms of processes. Um, we learned over time as well because we had what we have, the process of bid windows in terms of energy. So when we did the first, the second, we took longer. Now we know we at bid window six and very quicker, clear on what needs to be done and within the zone. Are you going to echo that this no, is no, working? No, I, I, just not because the, uh, a South African minister is sitting next to me. I invite every developing country or emerging market to take a look at the uh, renewable energy program of South Africa. Absolutely fantastic because it's structured and it is delivering mm -hmm. inclusive. It involves communities within the zone of that project becoming shareholders even in that project. It is driving local content development. It is cutting red tape. It is making it much easier. And it's attracted a hell of a lot of investment in. Huh? So, and it is delivering very competitively priced energy. So you can do it. It's not rocket science. As I keep saying, you know, private sector is very, very good at doing most things including following the rules if you set the rules right. And I just want to assure you that this isn't actually a setup because I had a hand in the seating and I didn't know that Aquapower had this relationship <laughs> with Minister Kubai. So this is completely um, a, a, a very, very <laughs> circumstantial. <laughs> he didn't know either. Minister Tasrif, let's talk about this trust between the developed and the developing world. Again, bringing this back to the issue of we need the developed world to help finance climate transition in emerging markets. You're also in, invested in Indonesia, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and now I see why, Paddy, you're sitting on, on that side in the central phase. Well, there should be a mutual benefit yes. between all parties. But isn't mutual benefit saving the world, sir? I will say so. Yeah, at least majority of it. Yeah. Now, so how come we can invite uh, such a party to, to participate in the development of our country? without a guarantee that they are getting a, a reasonable return. It is about... Yes. about there is a need and demand. They should be matched together. Patricia, we are racing towards COP27. As I have already alluded to, G20 presidential delegation in Indonesia in October. COP27 will be a pivotal moment for us as the world. And, and I think here we've got to go back to two and a half years ago when the COVID pandemic hit us. We have been given the opportunity to reset, recharge, and change the way that we do things. Remember those pictures of not one single person in New York, not one single person in London, not one single person in Kenya, in Johannesburg. This is unprecedented. And it means we have to do something different. So COP27, let's talk about this as we get to 15 minutes further to engage on this discussion, which again, I mean, this may be the last discussion I have as a moderator, and I really want to create some legacy for my children where they can say, well, my mother used to talk for a living, but at least she did something for climate change. So <laughs> Patricia, COP27, let's see what we can mobilize to COP27. Look, uh, COP27, COP as you very rightly say, is a pivotal moment. Uh, why? Because um, in Glasgow, we managed to finalize all the rules for the implementation of the Paris Agreement. So in, a, in many ways, we have left behind the negotiation phase and we are starting now the implementation phase. Now, we are going to be meeting in Sharm el Sheikh in a very complicated global environment. And uh, we need to be very conscious about that uh, because otherwise we will be unprepared, right? So we will be meeting in this very complicated environment. And yet, 
there is no way that we can, or leaders can go there and send the message to the world, to all the communities that are suffering from climate change, that, well, you know, this was not the right time to take action. We need to be able to show that there is progress towards full implementation. And as the minister was saying, uh, we have the plans, we have all those nationally determined contributions. Yes, some of them can be improved. Many have not even been started in, in being implemented, uh, but we have them. We have the, the big framework. We have all of that. So now it's a time where we need the investors to come. Yes, you're right. Also the governments to look at themselves and say, okay, what is it that I need to change in order to be able to attract uh, these investments? We need the IFIs also to uh, look at their own policies and their decision-making processes. And uh, I mean, we really need to get everybody, the industry, by the way, also in the different uh, uh, sectors of the economy, they are ready. They're, the pieces are there. We need to put to put them together. Just maybe one comment about the the island countries and the least developed countries. That I think for them we really need to work with a different uh, uh, mindset, uh, and they deserve and they require also the support. And it is also uh, their well-being. Uh, that will impact the well-being of everybody around the world. So Patricia, I think you make some very pertinent points there. And I want to pick up on the complex environment that we live in from a global perspective. Just last week, I hosted the African Development Bank joint meeting of finance ministers and agriculture ministers aimed at an emergency solution for the food crisis that is looming. Now, we don't know the impact of COVID-19 yet. It's too early to have any real indication of how COVID-19 has derailed climate finance. But as you say, a complex world, we've now got the food crisis. So how do we ensure that we don't get derailed with these short-term issues and really lose focus that this longer-term issue needs to be addressed in tandem? We cannot take money away from climate finance to deal with emergency situations. It needs to be done as a holistic solution. Patty. Yeah, well, look, I mean, you know, so 150 billion is going into the developing world for climate. Um, we're spending trillions on. So we're not going to take money away, by the way. Uh, what I think we need to do is to continue to focus on showcasing what is really being done, what can be done, what the progress that is being made, and continue to uh, push the private sector to blend uh, and, and multiply the uh, multiply the amount of money that is already available out there. So uh, today, the the challenge, as I keep saying, is about the the kind of lack of understanding of what is possible, what can be done, what is being done. And I think that's really what we need to continue to keep focusing on, and and start to really evangelize and showcase and go and do. Okay. So and we are just before stepping up uh, the conversation I just had, and we were both sharing our shared frustration. He's a minister, I'm from the private sector, I shared frustration of how things are slow, sorry, in his country, uh, to kind of move on and get it implemented. That's the reality. But okay, we need to look past that. And I think we can, and I think there is the sense of urgency. Don't forget, and we talk too much, by the way, about Renewable energy, renewable energy. Let's also not forget adaptation and everything else, huh? which are desperately needed. And Absolutely. Enough. We've only got 45 minutes, though. Not enough. And, and only enough. 10 left, actually. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but, but coming back, let's not... So it is not correct to say that um, investment in clean energy is sort of coming down. So last year, uh, 290 megawatts of new renewable energy capacity got installed in the world. Fully expecting 320 uh, megawatts, okay, this year. So it is. It's not going. coming down, but it, the uh, but rate it at which is go going up, up, Paddy, is reducing significantly. We're now at about 10%. Yeah, yeah. So it needs an to go basis. up much faster. Minister Kuba, I want to bring you to COP27. As South Africa going into COP27, how are you going to make that forum count? What we need to do is to make the financing accessible and conditions favorable. Yeah. Because unless we sort that out, it's not going to make us anywhere, going anywhere. So we're seeing the commitment. We are hearing about the amount of money that is available. But are the conditions favorable? 
Is it something that we can work with as countries? Because that's what is becoming an impediment. The fact that we are talking about COP27, we had COP26, we had commitments, they have not been implemented. When you say so make should... the conditions favorable, unpack that for me. Make the condition, for example, if you are to do grants, be clear in what amount you are putting on grants, what amount you are putting on, on, on loans, what amounts you are putting on... Co co so it's the regulatory so framework, the regulatory effectively. Fr framework, because, for example, and because it has to be within that country. For example, we had intention of utilizing the money that has been made available to us. It contradicts our conditions in the country, the laws of our country. So it's difficult. Minister of um, Environment comes back and says, I've managed to get this. Minister of Finance says, hang on, you can't. You know, because the conditions that you are carrying the money is not what we agree to. It's putting a burden to the state, it's putting the burden to the visitors. And that's what is important in terms of the conversation, because otherwise we talk about financing, we talk about, and therefore we leave conversation thinking that money is accessible, money is available. And it can't be money that is going to put countries, especially poor countries and developing countries, to long-term debts. It's not sustainable. Minister Tazrif, if we look at your portfolio as Minister of Resources and Energy in uh, Indonesia, and you've got to balance that with the Minister of Agriculture in Indonesia, who now is facing this looming food crisis, how do you ensure that the, the spend remains equitable, that you keep focusing on climate finance, on energy, on renewables, as well as provide for emergency situations like the looming food crisis? Well, uh, of course, uh, we should. First of all, I would like to make a clear up again. We are not frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> We both have to proceed with this. Yes, <laughs> yes. You, you are my partner, and then we work together. We, we, we will support all the things to achieve the goal. Yeah. Uh, Glad we could have that bilateral meeting, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, as, uh, as, uh, as Indonesia itself, that, uh, well, recently we have excess capacity of energy. Yeah, that, that uh, this is the thing that we have to overcome. How can we reduce the fossil energy source and bring the renewable to come? This is, this is the issues that uh, Paddy mentioned, Paddy, <laughs> Paddy mentioned uh, earlier. And uh, we have a program, how to make an early retirement. There is an ETM process right now being carried on. Hopefully we can conclude within, within this year, it will show yeah, the, 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 the collaboration, the support of financial institution yeah, to, to us in order to accelerate, to, 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 to bring more contribution to reduce, to reduce the, the emission. So if this thing happens, it might happen also to others. So I, I want to take a, a moment just to pull from the audience. And we've got Samila Zabaru, who is here from Africa Finance Corporation. We talk about development finance institutions. I'm going to ask for that mic, please, to be handed to Samila. It's just on the table there. Thank you very much. And if we could get your thoughts, Samila, on coming back. You know, we, we seven minutes to close. Coming back to mobilizing finance. It's been a discussion point. You've heard Patty say we need to have accessible financing at low rates. Can I get your input here, sir? Thank you very much. I think I would like to take us back to this real situation in Africa, you know, because we have, the real transition for us in Africa is really how to get more energy. Uh, because right now we are at about 180 kilowatts per hour. You know, most parts of the world, 6,000, 12,000. Yeah. You know, so that means that there is no emission per se. Uh, especially if you consider the fact that certain African countries, like South Africa Republic, is um, absorbing more than the, 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 the emit. So the real part for us is how do we save the forests that we have in Africa? Because they are the carbon sinks of the world. How do we give basic Africans better alternatives than firewood for cooking? How do we finance natural gas, LPG, and other such mechanisms that will conserve the forest. The forests are already absorbing most of the carbon dioxide of the world. We know that emissions have no borders, so the African forests are already absorbing carbon. 
So we need to conserve those forests. The second thing we need to look at is Africa's population is growing. So as we grow, we need to look at renewable sources of energy. Yeah. We need to look at solar, wind, hydro, to the extent possible. We also need to look at natural gas as well as a transition fuel, like everybody else in the world is doing. But we need financing for that to come through. So, for example, we used to get ECA financing for most natural gas projects, but we don't get that anymore. That goes to all the OECD countries. So we need to look at that again and see how we can have more export credit financing for Africa. And to his point, the interest rate is just too high. It's just too high. We need to find a way of bringing it down, especially because we know the default rate is much lower than anticipated. But more importantly, how Africa can help in the energy transition is that we need to stop these ocean-going voyages that go take raw materials from Africa to Asia and Europe for processing and then bring back to Africa. That has to stop. So, ocean-going so voyages are the sixth highest emitter in the world today, and we need to reduce that. Then, of course, we need to build more resilient infrastructure. Our infrastructure. I'm cognizant now that I'm almost into the close of our debate. I think you've given us a huge amount to think about as we go into to final comments. And I want to bring it back to climate transition in emerging markets, where we started. As I said, I really need to make this conversation count for my children, and the next four minutes are in your hands. So, Patricia, let's talk to one of the points that you want to drive home, and, and let's make this conversation for the developed world, for the ears of the developed world, because we know that's where the money sits. We know that that money needs to be deployed into emerging markets and close the gap. I'll leave you with that stat one more time. We need to increase climate finance by 590% annually in emerging markets to achieve Agenda 2030. Patricia. Well, I think it's, um, it's very clear and, and, and we have all the evidence that uh, investing in this transition in the emerging markets, but in general in the developing, developing world, is a big business opportunity also for uh, business and investors from the developed world. And I think this is not yet uh, fully understood. Uh, again, I mentioned uh, just a moment ago the, the case of uh, of the islands and the case of the LDCs, which may need to be to, will need to have a different treatment. But in general, and the evidence is there, uh, so many better jobs are being created, so much more value is added, so much uh, cheaper energy we are we are getting. Uh, so uh, I, I would say that this is. To me, the big message I would like to get. Two minutes, one minute each, Patty. Right across the emerging markets, sun shines every day, even in the middle of nowhere. All the rural households, the fastest way to electrify, get electricity penetration, rooftop, mini grids, micro grids, the business models are there, the components are cheap enough now. Um, huge multiplier impact. So if there's one thing, I, I think there are many more things, but if there's one thing that we want to target, that's one of the things that I would be pushing for in COP27 and how to get multilateral financing at a virtually at a grant rate supplemented by very low properly priced private sector to at least multiply that by three times. Minister, goodbye. For me to develop in countries that we do not only have to be the consumer of, of technology, when we set localization targets, work with us to develop because we would want to be the producers of the technology as a continent. Minister Tasrit. Yes, I think uh, every party in the emerging countries, they have to utilize whatever they have in the, in, uh, in the energy and inform them how to use the clean energy. And then the government can be support while waiting the support from outside. So let's see what is the capability inside and then try to develop the understanding you have to educate the people how to use the, the clean energy for their home. Thank you very much, Minister Tazrif. Well, we have one minute to go. And this morning when I was waiting for the shuttle for the Congress Center, I saw these two little girls. They must have been all of seven years old standing at the road crossing, the zebra crossing. 
They were holding hands and they were smiling. And I thought, you know what? That's the right place to end this discussion. Let's make it personal because let's use those two little girls that I saw this morning with smiles on their faces, skipping and hopping across the zebra crossing when the, the cars let them go through. Let's use them as representatives of all the children in the world. And let's mobilize the finance that we need as a starting point to close that gap. Let's get the developed world to work together with the emerging world to create a safer, sustainable world for all of our children and their children and their children. Thank you so much to my esteemed panel and thank you very much to our audience today. Thank you.